is one full week of cyberpunk Cyberpunk all five days Let's talk origins and some new romance Hi, I'm Michael Levers, and this is Fit to be Read. Not being an English lit scholar, and this not meant as an exhaustive documentary of the genre, I'll not attempt to state empirically the first appearance of the English word cyber. Most evidence I've come across points to Greek origins and the word kivernites, which sort of means orchestrator, or if we expand that, linking more closely to the term cyber, we can say orchestrator of applications. I'm not going to research the etymology of the word punk. I'll venture less sophisticated and leave punk as something where we know it when we see it. Also, when we think about cyberpunk science fiction, it's really the cyber that usually connects to the sci-fi and the punk that adds the flavor. I'm pretty happy with how that sounds, so I'm going to repeat that. Cyber brings the sci-fi and punk adds the flavor. If you want my deeper thoughts on what constitutes punk, I spoke in more detail on that in the What is Cyberpunk episode. Also in that episode, I briefly alluded to two of the most popular titles in the genre, Neuromancer and Snow Crash. These two worthy classics are inventive and imaginative, but we're not alone in introducing the literary world to cyberpunk. In today's episode, I'll focus on the origins of the genre and some notable early works up to and through the 1980s. The first appearance of the term cyberpunk is credited to author Bruce Bathke. Bruce Bathke wrote the short story Cyberpunk in 1980. The fantastic short story, later turned into a not-fantastic novel, appeared in a 1983 edition of Amazing Magazine. Recently, I released my list of top 10 all-time short stories. Bathke's Cyberpunk was not on that list, but it would definitely make an extended list. The story is credited with originating the word cyberpunk, but doesn't get much love beyond that. I find Cyberpunk by Bathke to be an excellent, imaginative, and a very fun short story. I'm not just saying that because the main character is also named Michael with a birthday in August. I'll thumbnail and link my top 10 short stories video at the end of this episode. The short story follows Michael and his beatnik hacker friends as they cause minor technological chaos with libraries and schools and some minor vandalism and eventually bank theft. Michael is likely a good kid, but spending enough time with this group of delinquents, it's not long before he's involved in some serious schemes, including blackmail. The original ending of the story might have helped catapult this story into my top 10, but Bathke eventually changed the ending in order to make it more desirable for publishers. It was still a good ending, but I would have preferred if he had kept the original ending that I felt gave it even more punk credibility. The story is available online and I don't wish to spoil it, so let me know in the comments if you think you might give it a read. The story includes some real gems like microterm, this is what Bathke called laptops, touch pads, and the phrase, I didn't glitch. If Neuromancer and Snow Crash had a baby and that baby was a short story, is the vibe I get with Bathke's cyberpunk. While Bathke coined the term, it didn't really reach deep into pop culture until William Gibson published his famous and prescient novel, Neuromancer, in 1984. Describing Neuromancer in his Washington Post article, Science Fiction in the 80s, Gardner Dozios, also a sci-fi author, helped cultivate the word's popularity. Before we get ahead of ourselves, I'm now going to back up a bit. Often overlooked in the origins of cyberpunk lit, is the incredible talent that is Samuel R. Delaney. In the late 60s, Delaney wrote two novels, Babel 17 and Nova, that feature many characteristics of the cyberpunk genre. Nova, published in 1968, is clearly a cyberpunk novel. Humans who jack into computers and other machinery via ports grafted into their bodies are referred to as cyber studs. The universe is decidedly a dystopian setting. Can a guy get some credit? Other authors of the 50s, 60s, and 70s credited with hosting imagery or subject matter related to the genre are Alfred Bester and his novels The Demolished Man and The Star's My Destination, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, 
and John Brunner's The Shockwave Rider, as well as works by Michael Moorcock and Harlan Ellison. Dick's novel is probably the only one on the list that would most feel completely appropriate on the cyberpunk shelf. One could even argue that Ray Bradbury's Illustrated Man from 1951 is an early explorer of the cultural phenomena of virtual reality connecting with the human mind. As mentioned, Gibson's Neuromancer really put cyberpunk on the map, but Gibson was not alone in examining these techno societies, punk cultures, and dark futures. These other works of the 1980s helped to popularize the genre and bring the themes and ideas of cyberpunk into the public consciousness. There was Bruce Sterling's short story Mozart in Mirror Shades in 1984 and his novel Shiz Matrix in 1985. Shiz Matrix, published in 1985, is a novel chock full of big ideas, humor, and also, unfortunately, one dimensional characters. Sterling's creative work delivers future humans, evolution, and biotech, post apocalyptic vibes, and a bit of, dare I say, lame sex. Author Pat Cadigan gave us Mind Players in 1987 and Sinners in 1991. Today I'm just going to talk about Mind Players. I have my reasons. Shirley, sorry I won't call you Shirley. Mind Players published in 1987 is set in near future Earth. People use madcaps that allow them to stimulate or alter their brains, effectively allowing the user any number of options to experience being somebody else, get psychotherapy, or do things more devious. The story follows a young female character, Allie, through her professional life, including run-ins with the brain police. Let's also talk about software written by Rudy Rucker and published in 1982. Software is book one of Rucker's Wear series. This is not a favorite of mine. Rucker introduces sentient robots in a novel that feels quite dated. The robots are called boppers, and at some point, they want to overthrow humans and blend everyone's mind into one consciousness. There are some cool ideas in this, and it's at times chuckle-worthy, but for me, it was frivolous, and it really lacked a punch. City Come A-Walkin' by John Shirley, published in 1980. I'll try to do this one justice, as it's been decades since I've read this one. This could be one to include on my upcoming top 210 science fiction books video if I get around to a reread. City Come A Walkin scores more points on the punk side than on the cyber and high tech side, but there is a computer culture of sorts, so the story does offer both. The setting is a very bleak future San Francisco, and the character of San Francisco and the collective consciousness of its inhabitants is heavy in the story. The main character is a nightclub owner who sort of is recruited into fighting the mob to clean up the city. Lewis Shiner's Frontera, published in 1984. In Frontera, corporate overlords have taken over and they rule the earth. They control everything, including information. This is pseudo-cyberpunk. There's a human colony on Mars that stumbled onto some technology that the corporations would like to get a hold of. Mars is ruled by a power-hungry lunatic who disappears his dissenters. Neural implants and stimulation stuff provides the cyber theme, and character development with the story's heroes and dissenters spark the punk vibes. This wasn't a great read for me, but it fits the bill as early cyberpunk. Next is True Names, published in 1981 by Werner Vinge. This is an obvious novella to point to as an influence for early cyberpunk works like Neuromancer and Snow Crash, and more recent titles like Ready Player One. True Names may not be Vinge's best work, but it was very foundational in introducing headgear to access a virtual reality world called The Other Plane and also hackers and other dissenter hacker characters like The Mailman and Mr. Slippery. Those are not their real names as they have to avoid being caught by their adversary, the US government. And of course, Burning Chrome is a 1982 short story penned by William Gibson. This story is often pointed to as the first and truest example of cyberpunk, a statement clearly up for debate. This is an excellent story about two hackers using computers and a Russian hacking program or virus to steal from a criminal enterprise and its notorious villainous leader, Chrome. The story introduces for the first time the term cyberspace, as well as a clever imagining of the sprawl, an area along the east coast of the United States where cities have bulged and expanded so greatly that they've merged to one gigantic region. Both cyberspace and the sprawl are introduced and discussed in greater detail in Gibson's Neuromancer. Finally, it's also relevant to share that 
Katsushiro Otomo's Japanese manga series Akira debuted in Japan in 1980. The series presents a biker gang and others in a post-apocalyptic future Tokyo trying to stop a powerful telekinetic from destroying the city. Akira is credited as a pioneering work of Japanese cyberpunk. While my intent is to focus on cyberpunk and literature, it's worthwhile to note that the popularity of the genre among our culture was also cultivated in great part by early hit cyberpunk films like Ridley Scott's 1982 Blade Runner, adapted from Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and later films Judge Dredd and The Matrix Trilogy in the 90s. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Leverts. This is Fit to be Read. Check out some of these other videos and catch the rest of Cyberpunk Week.